Good evening, everyone. My name is Evan Stankovic, Adult Programming Librarian at the Northside Library. And on behalf of the Jefferson Madison Regional Library, uh, we welcome you to this evening's same page event, a virtual tour of Morven Japanese Garden. Tonight's event and all general events have been made possible by the incredible and generous support of the Friends of the Library. Don't miss the Friends upcoming spring book sale, April 2nd through April 10th at the Albemarle Square Shopping Center at the old Northside Library location. This evening's event is part of JMRL's annual Same Page Community Read. Each year, this community-wide reading initiative provides opportunities for book groups, classrooms, and individuals to explore the themes of a single book by an author appearing at the Virginia Festival of the Book. Previous Same Page authors and titles have included Jacqueline Woodson's Brown Girl Dreaming, Lisa C's The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, and Nathan Englander's What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank, to name just a few. This year's Same Page selection is Tracy Chi, and her latest novel, We Are Not Free, the collective account of a tight-knit group of young second-generation Japanese-American citizens whose lives are irrevocably changed by the mass U.S. incarcerations of World War II. Please visit jmrl.org for a complete list of upcoming same-page programs and events such as this evening's, including an evening with Tracy Chi scheduled for March 17th. Same page is generously funded by the Friends of JMRL, supported by the Art and Jane Hess Fund of the Library Endowment and Virginia Festival of the Book, a program of Virginia Humanities. With that said, before I introduce this evening's presenter, I'd like to quickly cover a couple of things. Um, as a courtesy, we ask that all questions please be saved for the designated Q&A portion of the program at the end of the presentation. Uh, you can type in questions into the Q&A box or the chat box, and we will attempt to address as many as time permits. Additionally, the closed caption transcript has been enabled for this evening's program. You can activate this feature by selecting live transcript at the bottom of your screen and enable subtitles. Please note, despite the prompt you might receive, you cannot save or download the transcript and the transcription is by no means flawless. Finally, it is now my pleasure to introduce to you this evening's presenters from the University of Virginia Foundation, uh, this, sorry, from the University of Virginia Foundation's historic Morven Estate. Charlotte Devine is the Japanese Garden Curator at Morven Estate, and with us tonight is Frankie Sinski, who is Event Coordinator. I'd like to personally thank them both for having given me an in-person tour a while back of this incredible garden, and also for having put together this wonderful presentation. Um, this is a very special program, and we thank them for partnering with us in the same page event. And without further ado, I am now going to turn things over to Charlotte Devine to get us started. Thank you, Evan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Charlotte. Um, and as Evan mentioned, I've been the Morven Japanese Garden Curator for about one and a half years at this point. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is a wonderful partnership and an opportunity to connect um, on a really important piece of history um, and a really important culture in the United States, um, you know, in that connection. So start my slide, here we go. All right, so this uh, webinar is brought to you by the UVA Foundation, um, Morven Programs and the Jefferson Madison Regional Library, um, same page community read. Really quickly to go over our overview today, um, I'll start off by talking a little bit about the Morven estate history and the specifically the Japanese garden history. Um, from there, I'll talk a little bit about a brief history of Japanese garden design going all the way back to the 11th century um, and continuing on to the present day. I'll talk a little bit about the plants that we have here in the Morven Japanese garden and kind of their relationship to the broader uh, palette that you might see. And then we'll take a virtual tour inside a Sukiya style house, which is um, we are very fortunate to have in the garden today. I'll, I'll end with a little talk about the current and future uses of the garden. And then um, we'll end with a Q&A session um, after the presentation. So just really quickly to begin, um, Morven is run by the UVA Foundation. Um, which operates to provide real estate and financial services for the Uni University of Virginia. So we manage a lot of the assets um, such as Boar's Head, North, Fo North Fo Fork, and Morven, amongst many others. Um, we also have, oops, sorry, my slide isn't working. Morven Programs is 
um, kind of a UVA office oriented out here that runs a lot of our programming, working with students and faculty um, and even international groups that come to the property and use it for educational um, purposes. So if you all have any interest in using the property in any capacity or learning a little bit more about what they do, um, I put Frankie's email here and she can provide any extra information you might need. Oh, and um, we also have a really awesome seminar coming up on March 29th that you all can register for. Um, there's going to be a viewing here and then there's also a virtual option. And I think Frank, you might be able to put a link to that in the chat box for anyone interested. All right, so quickly to begin with a little coverage of Morvan's history, like so many properties in Virginia, its history really goes back to, you know, even before we have a, a really clear written record. In the 17th century, this land was inhabited and used by Monacan tribes, likely as hunting grounds, but there is much further research needed before that's conclusively uh, determined. In the 18th century, in 1730 specifically, the land was gifted by the crown to John Carter. Uh, it was called Indian Camp at that point. And then it was later purchased by Thomas Jefferson in 1795 in the name of his adoptive son, William Short. So Jefferson managed the land with tenant farmers in a sharecropping system, and they rotated crops to constantly reinvigorate the land. Um, so really progressive thinking for the time. In the 19th century, in 1813, the land was sold to a merchant named David Higginbotham, and he turned Morven back into a massive plantation that was run on enslaved labor. So we have a legacy of slavery here that um, a lot of EVA students and faculty have done research on and it continues. That's part of what the lecture on the 29th will, will cover. Um, but enslaved people in the house were auctioned off following the death of um, Higginbotham just before the Civil War. Um, the Smith family owned the property through the Civil War and then it was sold to two other families briefly um, before the, the 1900s. So in the 20th century, in 1926, Morvin was purchased by the Stone family, um, which was the longest residing family here on the property. And they used the property to breed cattle and thoroughbred horses. Additions were added to the house and the formal gardens were really uh, touched up. They were designed by Annette Hoyt Flanders and Miss Stone and they were officially added in the early 1930s. So um, our formal gardens here have been open for Virginia Garden Week since 1933, um, and they'll continue on even this year on April 23rd. So you all can check that out um, in the brochure if you'd like. So leading up to the modern day, in 1988, John Kluge purchased Morvin. He uh, was, a local philanthropist and um, very successful businessman for those who don't know. And he installed sculptures by Rodin and many others across the landscape um, to use it almost as an outdoor gallery of sorts. He was a big connoisseur of um, art collections as well as a great admirer of other cultures. And he was particularly fond of uh, Japanese culture. So he began the project of commissioning a Japanese garden in the early 1990s, and that'll be the focus of our talk here today. Um, today, the property is used, as I mentioned, by Morvan programs um, in service of the University of Virginia for a lot of educational activities. Um, increasingly, we have community groups coming out here for educational purposes, garden day, as I mentioned, um, and there is still active farming that takes place on the property. All right, so to dive right into the Japanese garden history, um, I wanna preface by saying this was a massive collaborative effort. Um, it really was conceptualized in 1992, but construction and installation continued through early 1996. So this was a multi-year, um, you know, very highly staffed <laughs> project to install. Um, these are some of the individuals and firms that were involved in various aspects of the, uh, the design and implementation. Um, in particular, the landscape proposal was developed by Will Riley and Associates. Um, the house and floor plans were a little 
bit of a collaborative effort between Len Brackett and Mr. Watanabe Seke Kobo. And the garden construction was largely by Iwaki Zoan, which was a design build firm in Japan. Um, I also always like to give credit to Haley Chisholm and Morris because, uh, who were the excavators, because there are just an incredible number of boulders <laughs> that had to be moved into the garden. Um, and it's kind of in a basin of sorts. So there was a lot of excavation and heavy equipment that had to go down there. All right, so as I mentioned, concept conceptualization really started in 1992. Um, and I wanna mention that the garden design process in the Japanese tradition is very different from um, our Western mode of, of design. It's much less planned. Um, it's a more organic development of the plants as the project evolves. And so a lot of the initial work started with kind of the heavy, infrastructure like the pathways and the, the pond placement and things like that. So in these pictures here, you can see that they've laid the outline for the foundation of the house and they're starting to um, place some of the more permanent pieces, hardscape elements like the lantern and some of the stones. Um, so here are those boulders that I was talking about. Um, this is what will eventually become the dry garden behind the house. And I just want you to remember this picture because um, we'll see what it looks like today. It's, it's a pretty amazing transition in, in just about 25 years. So as I mentioned, there is just an incredible art and uh, skill involved in installing hardscape elements like this. Heavy equipment was used to move a lot of things, but ultimately a lot of the work is, is hand done and has, is really requires a high degree of, of craftsmanship. Um, so there were a lot of Japanese gardeners, a lot of um, Japanese uh, builders and you know, art, artisanal craftsmen, craftsmen who came over and lived on property for you know, the duration of the project. So we, we really have them to thank for that. Here you can see um, the house, which we haven't seen yet, is a prefab construction from Japan. As I mentioned, it was ultimately really designed by Watanabe Seke Kobo, and it was reconstructed on site by Sam Ta Takeuchi and um, his company. So it arrived in panels and pieces like this. It's a timber frame construction, um, and it's in the Sukiya style, which means that it's very simple, refined, and made of natural materials. So here you can see the skeleton of the house, um, really beautiful, Hinoki cy cypress and um, cedar were really some of the primary woods used for their longevity. And as I mentioned, it's just an incredible amount of attention to detail and, and hand, -done, hand done work. So on the left, you can see he's laying the copper tiles on top of the roof. Um, they don't look like that anymore. They've aged really beautifully, which was the intent. And here you can see this was a ceremony called the Ridge Framework Ceremony that took place uh, in June of 1995. Um, the house itself took 120 days to reconstruct, and this was a blessing of sorts on the house um, to prepare it for use later on. The final pavilion was finished in January of 1996. And that is kind of the, the final product. Um, ultimately, it looks very different today, you'll see, but um, this is a pavilion summer style house, classically a, a tea house. It has a tea ceremony function to it, but a tea house, which some people accidentally call this, is really much, much smaller. It's, um, I mean, maybe on, on the scale of 20 feet by 20 feet or something like that. So this is a, a really large floor plan comparatively. All right. So to give a quick overview and to tie this presentation to the book that many of you are reading, um, Japanese gardens in the US had a big evolution from their introduction really in the late 1800s to the present day. In the, um, I guess before World War II, their first appearance in the US was really in many of the World's Fairs exhibitions. So the two images to the left are from the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. 
um, the ones from the right in, I think, 1903 or 1907 um, from St. Louis. Um, at this point, they had people staged, you know, around the exhibits and things like that in Japanese, traditional Japanese clothing. And it was somewhat with the peak of um, this concept of Orientalism, which is not exactly an accurate, it's not an accurate or really respectful representation of, of the Japanese culture. So from there, after World War II, Japanese gardens kind of received a second look and were used in a very different way. Um, I would say they were designed with a lot more respect and they were used as a mode of facilitating peace um, as peace symbols following World War II. So a shift occurred and there were then a form of cross-cultural mending and personal reflection. So today Japanese gardens have evolved even beyond this to be really important resources in, in, in increasing emphasis on mindfulness and reestablishing a connection with nature. All right, so to go back even farther in Japanese uh, garden design, really the skeleton or really the core of what we see in Japanese gardens today originated in the mid to late 11th century um, during the Heian period in Japan, um, with, which is really reflected or captured in the sakuteki, which translates to record of garden making. So this was a tech, really technical manual. Um, we don't know the, uh, the author for sure. It was probably Takibana no Toshitsuna, who was a government official and a member of the aristocracy. Um, actually, a lot of the garden designers of the time were in the elite class or government officials, the, or even um, Buddhist priests in some cases. The people actually implementing or you know, building the gardens were really typically the serfs of the aristocracy who designed it. Um, as I mentioned, it's an incredibly technical handbook. A lot of the construction guidelines that are present in the book are still used in Japanese gardens today. The image to the right, you can see um, there are some stones on the base of the pillars that support the house and um, the same construction technique and orientation of, of stones like that are, are used in the house here um, at Morven. So Kyoto was really the home of Japanese garden design. In 794, the city was really established and it actually contains a lot of natural springs and very easily accessible groundwater, which is why you actually see a lot of water features in Japanese gardens from very early on. Um, the city itself was chosen, or the location of the city was chosen because of fa favorable geomantic conditions, um, which is this idea that there's a balance in, a, in, a, in the orientation of, of different features in, in, the, in the world. Um, so Kyoto in some ways became a model for the garden in, in terms of these principles. Um, the type of architecture that was present with gardens like this um, is what we call Shinden architecture. It involved a main hall with annexes uh, that connected the various residences um, of the family and utilities. And they were usually connected with breezeways that had tiny little gardens, gardens in between, very, very simplistic. Um, two more elaborate main garden spaces were associated. You can see them below the house structure down below. Um, the area that looks almost like an open beach was called the Southern Court and the area south of that was the main garden. So the Southern Court was used for things like games and performances the main garden was more for, um, you could have performances maybe on the island or something like that, but it was also for, for enjoying the natural world. Um, so there were several influences in Japanese garden design from the very start. Um, the Shinto belief system, Buddhism and geomancy were um, incredibly influential. Um, the location of the pond to the south of the house um, and water features typically winding from the um, 
east to south to southwest is indicative of that ge those geomantic principles that I mentioned earlier. Stones were a really important feature of the garden, um, and they still remain so today. They serve a structural purpose, obviously, but they also um, are aesthetic and they're incredibly allegorical in terms of um, representing Buddhist, or uh, sorry, not representing, in terms of uh, as important sites for, for Buddhist deities. Um, stones in the Sh in Shinto um, belief are also used as prayer sites. They were considered to be animate objects with their own desires. And waterfalls were typically pilgrimage sites um, to the for to Buddhist deities, like I mentioned. Um, I guess some other important features in the garden is this concept of rusticity and aesthetics really ties back to Buddhism when it became popular in Japan. Um, so this pond here, this is, I guess, a good moment to talk about how we still have to be really careful about imbibing Western concepts onto Japanese design. Um, this garden, or this, sorry, this pond has, I've heard it described in some sense um, as, I guess, a metaphor of sorts to uh, life in a way, which is interesting, but in Japanese culture, you don't necessarily have design as representative or, you know, metaphorical to, to something in real life. It's a little more open, it is more open to interpretation. But I think the, um, the allegory, the idea is that the pond is life, the two waterfalls flowing in are one female, one male kind of create life. There's dead wood around the shores that kind of symbolizes the, the dead wood you accumulate throughout your life. And the island itself is something like the island of paradise. So what you aspire to at the end of your life. Um, again, it's an interesting conversation. And uh, I just read an article this year that said you have to be really careful about imparting Western ideas like that onto, onto Japanese design. So in terms of the role of nature, gardens are supposed to capture the essence of nature. They're not an exact reproduction. It should be very closely observed, but it needs to be translated as an art form rather than an exact replication of the natural world. Um, water and mountains are usually really important in contrasting elements that are represented in the garden. So that's the yin and yang. Um, Senzui means water mountain, and it appears in the word Karen Sinsuni, which is um, a, a dry garden style of uh, garden design that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, originally, it's really interesting. A lot of the plants used in gardens were likely collected from the wild. Um, old trees have always been given a preference to establish a sense of age in the garden. And many of the plants and garden elements that appeared for the first time in the Heian period um, were really inspired by Chinese garden design and then reappropriated in Japan and changed to um, form this like national identity of sorts as uh, the style of Japanese gardens was distinctive as very naturalistic and organic in, in their form. Um, so really kind of Japan creating its, its very unique culture. Um, oh, and nature in the house. So we'll talk about this a lot. The orientation of the house to the garden is absolutely critical in Japanese garden design, uh, you know, tracing all the way back to the 11th century. Um, the garden is considered as a work of art to walk through, and it's not necessarily a place to relax or play. Um, the, or it, it's more a place to relax and not a place to play. So two of the main features I guess connecting the outdoors and the indoors are the ngawa, which is the porch on the outside of the house that you see here, and then the threshold into the garden, which we'll talk about um, when you guys see a picture a little bit later. So quickly to touch on some plants for the plant lovers out there. Um, the Morvan Japanese garden is a really unique mix of native and Japanese cultivars. We call it a hybrid garden here. Um, some of the Japanese cultivars are things like Ethereum and the toad lily that you see up on the top here. The two bottom images are 
more um, their native plants, Phlox solanifera and um, polystichum, a, a native fern. So you can see there's um, a lot of, there, it's just, it's an incredible mix because the culture, or sorry, the climates between Japan and um, Virginia are actually very similar in, in terms of seasonality and, and temperature and humidity. So some of the other really important plants are larger. Those were more of the ground cover varieties. Um, I like to think of the garden in terms of layers. You start with the ground cover, then there's this layer of more um, evergreen and, and deciduous shrubs, like middle height, and then a deciduous canopy layer. And then there's actually a perimeter planting of evergreens, like cryptomeria that shield the garden and really make it into a retreat separate from the rest of the property. Um, so here you can see some of our trees. We have um, the Punus mume, which is in the middle there with the blossoms. That's from today, I took that picture. So it's in full bloom. Um, the Japanese maples are absolutely amazing and come in a bajillion different colors. Um, we have Probably the most prolific plants are the Pieris japonica that you see on the bottom left and the Osmanthus, Fortune's Osmanthus in the, on the middle bottom. Um, but I always like to encourage native volunteers that might, might pop up like the, uh, the cedar that you see um, to the bottom right in this image here, um, which, you know, <laughs> it popped up on its own, but with proper pruning and as it grows, it'll, it'll be a really nice foundation tree in the garden. Okay, so everyone's favorite and least favorite plant simultaneously, bamboo. It's beautiful, please don't plant it. It's really invasive. So um, here we are able to keep it in check to some extent by going through every spring when it pops up and kicking down the shoots um, when they're really soft and pliable. But the um, bamboo that you see on the left is Phyllostachys um, henon is the, the variety and it can grow up to 60 feet tall. Um, our smallest bamboo is about six inches tall. So it comes in, in many different sizes, but the rhizomes are just really aggressive and can hop edges, hop sidewalks, whatever. <laughs> so it's, it's, definitely a, it's definitely an aggressive plant. All right, I included this slide to talk a little bit about the importance of giving a sense of age in the garden. So a lot of the rocks were selected based on the presence of features like lichen and um, things that gave them character, but also features that give them a sense of age and having been in that place for, for a very long time. The pruning style is similar. Um, as many of you who garden might know, you can usually chop a lot of shrubs to the ground to rejuvenate growth, but that's not actually something I try to, we try to do in this garden because it's much more true to form, I guess, to emphasize features like, you know, contorted trunks that suggest a sense that the tree's been there for, for years and years. So the concept of wabi-sabi and seasonality are incredibly important when thinking about adding new plants to the garden um, and preserving what's there. So wabi-sabi is the idea that there is imperfection and impermanence and fleeting beauty in every season and every moment and every day. Um, there's really a very strategic window of, of bloom time in Japanese gardens, which is in the springtime. So you won't see many pure, you know, true Japanese gardens planting um, a lot of annuals or things like that because their long blooms are, are not, you know, true to this principle. Um, the summer is more about emphasizing differences in shades of green and the way that the light plays off of the different foliage um, colors. And then the fall is obviously an incredible show. <laughs> so if, if anyone ever gets the chance to come here in person, uh, usually the first or second week of November is, is just absolutely breathtaking. And here are some of our blooms that are either about to pop or are currently going. Um, the flower on the far left is the Pieris japonica that I mentioned. We have probably about 300 in the garden. 
And I mean, you just walk through now and you get hit with this wave of perfume. It's amazing. Um, azaleas are another great example of a plant we can, we can use. Um, red buds are a native plant that um, we have in the informal entranceway leading to the garden. And then you'll see floral arrangements usually emphasize this same concept, both inside and outside the Japanese house. So um, here, these are apple blossoms and a camellia from elsewhere on the property. Okay, so I'm going to play this little video we took, um, or I'm sorry, Frankie, one of Frankie's interns took um, to give you all a sense of what it's actually like to walk into the garden and through the pavilion. So um, I'm going to leave the sound on because a lot of experiencing the garden and the house is actually about involving all your senses. So it's really important to be able to hear and to feel the sound of your feet on the gravel and to hear the trickling of water as you move throughout. Okay, perfect. Awesome. So um, that is the winter in the garden. It's um, about, about to all turn green again, um, but we have some really great structural evergreen plants. Um, and I think the beauty of the rocks is really brought out in a clip like that. Um, so I will have a um, series of stills for you here so you can see the garden in, in different seasons when there's a little more um, leaf matter going on. You can see here, this is the, the bathroom that Alex briefly showed in that video. We didn't have the, the panels open there, but here you can see it's this beautiful view out into the garden. There's an emphasis on all that wonderful, beautifully treated natural wood. Um, 
the, I guess you can't really see the walls here. A lot of the walls throughout the, the pavilion are actually made of, of a mud that was shipped in bags from Japan. It's called Dukaku. And it was mixed with a little bit of the native clay to give it a hue that matches or is more ref, ref, in reference to the, to the local soil. Um, the outside of the house also was originally uh, crafted with that mud, but they had to replace it with a more synthetic stucco after the animals got involved. So luckily there's still some of that material present on the inside. Um, in this image here, you can see bamboo is really beautifully treated and preserved in that light fixture. Um, there's kind of a rain style shower here to the right. And then the bathtub that you see to the left is in the traditional um, Jap wooden bath bathtub style of Japan. Um, so I guess kind of the core of, of the building for us is what I refer to as the ceremony room. Um, so the way of tea is really embodies the, the principle of Wabi Sabi that we mentioned before. Um, it, 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 a tea ceremony involves sharing tea with guests. That's kind of at the core of it. Everything in the ceremony is seasonal and reflective of, of that principle. Um, you know, it's always changing, it's ephemeral. So there's this idea that no ceremony should ever be identical to another. Your guests change, their reason for being there changes, the floral arrangements will change with them. Um, the scroll that you see on the wall uh, there will change. And um, even the utensils that are used in the ceremony will reflect the specific, um, I guess, mood or, or feeling of the ceremony itself. So typically your most honored guests will sit with their back to the tokonoma, which is that little alcove where the scroll is placed on the wall and they'll look out toward the garden. So there are a ton of nuances and etiquettes involved in a tea ceremony. Um, we have a wonderful um, woman named Hiromi Johnson who comes out here and um, leads groups through tea ceremonies. And it's just truly beautiful to behold and, and really special to be part of. Um, sweets are offered as well as um, thin or thick tea. And these are all typically prepared in a mizua, mizua, which is kind of like a kitchen prep area. We have a pretty large one here in the pavilion, um, but even in a tea house, you might have something like that. Um, you can see there's really minimal decoration here, usually only something like the scroll that you see and perhaps um, an ikibana or chibana, which is a more simplistic floral arrangement. Um, some features of note are the shoji screens that are the, the rice paper screens that you see there that can be, um, that are on kind of a sliding groove to open up the house up to the outdoors. And the house is protected by wooden panels that actually store in compartments on the outside of the house. So they're not even visible in the picture here. Um, there's a special alcove under the table that Mr. Kluge requested specifically for Western guests who are not used to sitting on the ground. Um, and there are also tatami mat heaters um, underneath the floor uh, surface, which is pretty fancy, but um, very appreciated. So the table itself is made of Zalkova wood. Um, I was talking to a Japanese carpenter who uh, frequently comes to the property and he was saying he thinks it's a veneer of sorts that's put, put over a more simple wood. Um, these are those thresholds that I was talking about earlier as being very important. The Ngawa, again, is that porch that connects to the outdoors. Um, the threshold into the garden mark, marks the transition from the less formal entrance path into the, the actual garden itself. So it's a little hard to see in the picture here, but the pathway material changes from the two points. And there's also a very specific stepping stone on the other side of the, the threshold there that marks that transition point from one space to the next. Um, there's a beautiful or two beautiful cutouts of, in the shape of dogwood flowers on the doors, which were placed there in reference to, you know, the locality and, and of, of the garden here in Virginia, which is a really nice detail. Um, I should mention, I'm sure I'll mention it again, everything in the garden is incredibly intentional and thoughtfully done, um, which is really in that Japanese tradition. 
So here we can see the dry court courtyard that I mentioned earlier um, as a Kara Sensui. And it's a really simple design, classically, that emphasizes a bed of raked gravel, um, might feature some rocks, and it's typically just surrounded by um, a simple palette of shrubs. So some of these dry gardens date back to the 1300s, and the stones are meant to embody the spirituality of Zen. Typically, traditional dry gardens are viewed from inside the building and not entered. Ours can be traversed, and ours has kind of evolved into a more natural freeform interpretation of the dry garden. Um, so there are a lot of volunteers and ferns and moss that have, have crept into the landscape. Um, the gravel is typically, and it is here as well, a distinctive color that alludes to water. And a lot of the rocks and boulders might re represent, um, you know, reference larger landforms or, or specific landscapes. So other built features are very few, but the Azumaya is a waterfall viewing pavilion um, to the left there. It provides shade and while you're sitting there, you should be able to see the exit point of um, three small rapids, um, or sorry, not rapids, three small falls um, as they exit into the pond or below. Um, I just think these are beautiful and you know, representative of the importance of hand done things in, in Japanese craft. These are ceramic urns that you see to the right that have been repurposed as seats in the garden. Um, and they've really aged beautifully um, like everything else. So I just included some stills here of the garden, um, giving kind of a similar experience to that video that you saw, but more in the season that's about to come. Um, this is what we call Redbud Hill. It's that more informal pathway leading down into the formal garden itself. Um, you can see a couple lace leaf maples there dotting the landscape, and then the red buds extend all the way um, almost to the edge of the, of the threshold. So this is Redbud Hill, I think in late spring, probably. So a drastic change from, from that earlier landscape that you saw, even though they're the same plants. Um, there's that entranceway again. And this is the entrance into what is a stroll garden, is what we call it. Um, it's about four acres in its entirety, and it's meant to reveal new perspectives to the users as you move throughout the space. So um, this particular stroll garden is designed in the hill and pond style, which typically represents mountains and oceans um, of, of the larger landscape. So the paths will vary in topography, they'll switch back in places, and the materiality of the different pathways will vary based on you know, the intent of the experience in that particular moment. So here you can see that house just suddenly appeared out of nowhere. Um, this garden also, I should mention, is inspired by the famous moss temple, Sehoji in Kyoto, um, which Mr. Kluge really, really liked. Um, so they shipped moss in from Maine and Georgia, and they were constantly installing uh, new moss throughout the garden. This is a scubai, which is a basin used in purif purification ceremonies um, before, or rituals before the tea ceremonies. Um, typically, there's a bamboo ladle that rests on the edge, and you clean your hands with the water, which is potable. It comes out of the bamboo spout there. And um, you actually kind of sip the water and spit it onto the stones around the basin to um, re represent a, a transition from, from kind of the daily concerns into a more pure, refreshing space. This is the entrance into the dry garden in the back and really beautiful features, the rain chain that you can kind of see hanging down from the gutter. Um, when it rains, the rain just slowly trickles down the chain into the, the little uh, gutter, the little uh, drain below. So it, it's really elegant and pretty. Um, these are the boulders that you all saw in that early construction photo. This is that almost that same view. So you can see that, you know, the natural world kind of takes on a mind of its own and um, it required a lot of vision and um, I guess trust in, in the plants to really 
turn into something completely different from, from what it looked like when it was initially installed. Um, this is a little fence that was recently rebuilt. Um, features on the outside need to be touched up every now and then. Um, but the stones that you can see there, really any individually spaced stones like that are usually meant to, to represent a transition of sorts or an area leading up to a view or some kind of experience that you should expect. You're not supposed to run throughout this garden, you're supposed to move slowly and intentionally. Um, this is that house, the house again. Um, looking down the hill, the pond is to the left of this image. These bamboo screens that you see hanging from the rafters are almost like brisoles. They kind of protect um, the house from sun and they also cool um, people who are sitting on the, the porch. There's a switchback that I talked about earlier. And then that's just on the other side of the switchback. So you can see your perspective again, totally changes as you're moving down. A lot of the trees can be used as frames of sorts to really enhance those views from different points. Um, and then the bamboo, we, we've had a group recently use this space as a yoga studio, an outdoor yoga studio to do a session out here, which um, the acoustics are really cool. And in the summer, the temperature drops probably five to 10 degrees. It's really incredible in that little grove. The Azumaya here is tucked back against the bamboo. And um, I guess this is another built feature. This is a wooden bridge that was installed later in the, the garden design. Um, it's another materiality that has kind of gained its own beautiful patina just from uh, weathering and, and natural aging processes. There's the view back up to the house from across the pond. Um, I don't think they're blooming in this picture, but one of our flowering plants here, um, kind of just below the path is the iris japonica that you see. And then here is the smaller of the two waterfalls. The larger waterfall extends a much greater distance and it's not quite as dramatic, but this one pulls from a well and actually refills the pond when the level gets pretty low. And this is, I just put in here to emphasize the different effect of seasonality on your experience of the garden. Um, it's really an incredible shift and it happens in a matter of, you know, 10 days or something like that. So um, it's really cool to be there for the transition. So just to, to close up, um, Morven is, or the Japanese garden at Morven has been used a lot uh, for tea ceremonies, as I mentioned. We've had a lot of groups come out here to conduct mindfulness retreats, um, faculty, external, um, you know, hospital groups. Uh, we've had a lot of people come through on various types of tours. If, if I'm leading the tour, if Frankie's leading the tour, um, we tend to emphasize things that the groups are particularly interested in. Um, we recently had a calligraphy workshop down in the garden, which was a big hit. Um, and I imagine we'll be doing a lot more of that in the future. Contemplative walks are, what I mean by that are just people who are on the property for other reasons frequently will kind of happen upon the Japanese garden or are lucky enough to find it. and. I mean, it's really, really wonderfully relaxing to just move throughout and calmly take everything in. Uh, we've recently also had, I guess, some new partnerships with, with UVA groups in terms of, I'll call them materiality collaborations. Um, on the bottom left here, you can see our, um, the Morven Kitchen Garden Head leading um, some students in using bamboo to create actually planters for some of their, their lettuces and stuff, um, which you can see down in the kitchen garden. And then we've had groups come from uh, you know, the School of Architecture to harvest local materials instead of having to ship them from far away. Um, to the right is the new home of my pollinator project. It's called Pollinator Hill. The cedar trunk that you see here 
is actually a natural beehive that uh, I hope to support by planting out the hill with, I think I put in about 300, 350 different plugs of native pollinator plants. So that's really exciting. And this will be its first year um, blooming, hopefully. So thank you everyone for, for being here and, and tuning in tonight. I'm happy to take some questions. I, I don't know how much time we have, but um, I'll answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Fantastic presentation. Uh, Frankie, if you wanted to rejoin us, uh, maybe we could do some questions, maybe 10, 15 minutes. Uh, 